Okay, uh, we're moving in now to open session. Um, Claire, Morris, um, or Claire, Billy and Morris are joining us, Bradley are joining us by Starleaf. Uh, we have an apology in, apologies in from John, John Blair and uh, Patsy Malone. And as we know from previously, the uh, committee meeting will be recorded and broadcast throughout current buildings and online. And you can use the mobile devices as long as they're in there. And all muted. Um, we have noted the apologies. Um, in terms of chairperson's bu uh, business, um, the, I want to invite members that the dear permanent secretary and three of his of his senior officials uh, will be providing oral evidence to the NA Affairs Committee on the 9th of December. And I want to refer members uh, to the note of the informal meeting held on the 19th of November with the Scottish Committee on uh, Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Affairs. This is page 6 to 7 of your pack. I was agreed that a future meeting will be held uh, if it was considered uh, beneficial. Uh, members, okay to note that? Uh, I want to also refer you to the note of an informal meeting with the Ulster Angling Federation on the 24th of November at page uh, 8 to 9. And can I seek agreement for the following actions? I'd be right to the department on the issues outlined in the note of the meeting and ask for comments. Right to Lock Citizens in Inland Fisheries. DERA requesting uh, what is being done for angling development in communities and angling clubs. I'm right to Lock Agency Sports and I and Tourism and I to ask if market, uh, the marketing of angling, uh, marketing of angling, and if so, how they're going to do it. Okay. One of the members that a virtual information meeting has been arranged for Friday tomorrow at 4 p.m. with Youth Climate Action. Myself and Philip will be uh, attending. Um, and. Uh, if any members want to join in that Youth Climate Action uh, meeting, uh, uh, and you're all very welcome, uh, please indicate now so that uh, the make arrangements uh, by uh, Starleaf to join at 4 p.m. tomorrow, Friday. Okay. Uh, yeah. Have you indicated there? Yeah, please. <coughs> Barbara, that Claire wants to join us at 4 p.m. tomorrow with Youth Climate Action. Claire. Mm -hmm. Okay. Chair. Yeah. Could I just one wee comment? I, I'm, I was actually surprised uh, how much on your angling meeting, how much the percentage of water has went down hill, you would think. Mm -hmm. It's really, yeah. really noticeable, wasn't it? I mean, I was just wondering, do you think it's really got that much worse, or do you think it was down to this maybe being better monitored now? What, yeah. what idea did you get? Uh, well, suppose the um, Philip, you can. You were at the meeting as well. Um, look, what was your assessment of it? Well, I mean, I think that's. I mean, they, they were concerned about yeah, about it, yeah. and I mean, that's why I think we need answers from mm -hmm. the department just yes, to interesting. Yeah. see what the crack is. Very good. No, I don't mean it's not okay, sir. Uh, yeah, and yeah. Uh, they're also very concerned, um, anxious that there's more effort put in an across departmental approach to yeah. England. Well, you know, so um, we'll get some feedback from the from the department. Yeah, the issues yeah. that were raised. Yeah. Good work, anyway, you stayed at one. <laughs> well, we, 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 uh, good work to Ulster Angla, Anglin Federation yeah. for going on. Yeah. They're, they're very detailed, they're, they're well across their brief, and they're um, give a um, very detailed um, a briefing to us with it, and with some follow action points we're going to follow up here. Yeah. Thank so, you, Chair. Okay. Well, item 3 there <coughs> is the... Uh, uh, the draft minutes, 11 to 18. Um, members okay with these draft minutes for me to put my side here to them? Yep. Happy enough. Okay. Um, okay. Then there's no matter to rise. So the next item on the agenda is number five. It's oral evidence from the Department on Common Framework for Chemicals and Pesticides. Uh, the departmental correspondence is 21 to 22 on PACs, and a summary of the uh, framework is at 23 to 34, and a memo from Clark at pages 3 to 8 of the tabled papers. I'd like to welcome at this juncture, uh, by Starleaf, um, Caroline Barry, Acting Head of Chemical Industrial and Industrial Pollution Policy, Tommy McNamara, Staff Officer of the <coughs> Farming Branch, and Helen Lewis, Principal Scientific Officer heads of chemical regulations and um, I'd like to um, invite the um, officials to begin the presentation and that will be followed by uh, questions uh, from members so if you, if you want to just kick off there whoever whichever one of the three years wants to start first then 
we're very up we're you're very welcome to start now. Good morning, um, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Um, um, so it's Caroline Barry here. Um, uh, I'm just going to start and kick off by giving you a, a, a bit of an overview of the common framework for chemicals and pesticides. Now, the committee will be aware that DARE officials have been working with their counterparts in DEFRA and other developed administrations, government departments and relevant agencies over the course of the last two years to develop a range of new common policy frameworks, which once agreed will come into operation at the end of the transition period. Now, the Chemicals and Pesticides Common Framework, um, given um, the scope and impact of the legislation it covers, is deemed to be uh, one of the priority frameworks. It is also cross-cutting, and uh, with both DERA and the Department for Economy having an interest. The legislation and international obligations within the framework for which DERA has responsibility includes REACH, uh, plant protection products, persisting persistent organic pollutants, detergents, mercury, and the transboundary movements of hazardous waste under the Basel Convention. Now, the framework covers other chemical regime, regimes for which the Department for Economy has policy responsibility, such as the Basside Products Regulations, uh, prior informed consent, and the classification, labeling, and packaging uh, regulations. Uh, Department for Economy also has a joint regulatory role with DARE under REACH. And the committee in recent weeks has been briefed on a number of related UK-wide uh, UK EU exit SIs and Northern Ireland SRs relating to REACH, POPs, detergents, mercury and the transboundary movements of hazardous waste. These are vital to ensuring Northern Ireland has a functioning rulebook after the end of the transition period and it is in accordance with the Northern Ireland Pro and is in accordance with the Northern Ireland Protocol. Now the, the main purpose for the UK Common Framework is to develop UK wide arrangements for those powers falling within the devolved competence which are repatriated from the EU. UK wide common framework should be established to ensure consistency with the court and coordination and to determine how divergence can best be addressed. Now, this particular framework has been designed to support the fact of regulation and administration of chemicals and pesticides across the UK, to enable the functioning of the UK internal market, and to ensure regulatory burdens are kept to a minimum. The framework development process to date has involved detailed discussions between officials in the devolved administrations, relevant agencies and the UK government. They propose governance structures and decision-making processes which will be required for effective joint working within the UK after the EU exit. The arrangements put in place will respect devolution statement at settlements and establish constitutional conventions and practices while recognising that it is the role of ministers ultimately, ultimately to make policy decisions. It also takes account of the Northern Ireland Protocol which sets out the arrangements between the UK and the EU in relation to these areas, where, although remaining within the UK's customs territory, Northern Ireland remain aligned with the EU. In terms of what the current provisions, um, provisional framework actually looks like, it consists of a framework outline agreement, concordat, and new governance structures, um, through which issues relating to chemicals, regulations and management can be resolved. The Framework Outline Agreement is a high-level document which sets out um, proposed policy approaches and operational governance arrangements for future working. Uh, a concordat between DEFRA, HSE, um, the, the English Environment Agency, DERA, Department of Economy, Scottish Government and Welsh Government is proposed to underpin the framework. It will provide the basis for managing and maintaining commonality and approach, uh, minimum standards and the sharing of information and governance arrangements. It also provides the finer detail on how governance structures will operate, programmes of work developed, resource allocation, dispute resolution mechanisms and framework review. In terms of governance, over the past two years, various working groups have been set up, such as the Chemicals, Pesticides and Biocides Delivery Boards and Enforcement Liaison Group, which are supported by a number of expert groups and thematic subgroups. 
Overall governance is managed by the UK um, Chemicals Governance Group. And this group's role is to develop a UK view on the prioritisation of the UK Chemicals Work Programme and provide a strategic steer on the deployment of, of available resources. And membership is comprised of senior officials from DEFRA, HSE, EA and the various devolved administrations. Uh, a summary paper on the Provisional Common Framework for Chemicals and Pesticides has already been shared with the committee prior to today's meeting for information. It sets out more detailed background information on the development of the framework to date, the legislative regimes that will be covered, the main proposals for joint working and how the process will be taken forward between now and the end of the implementation period. Now, during phase three of the framework development process, a copy of the summary document was shared with a wide range of stakeholders from across the UK. This included NGOs, trade associations and Northern Ireland specific stakeholders, such as business in the community, um, the Ulster Farmers Union, Northern Ireland Environment Link, etc. And they were contacted and asked it, uh, by, by correspondence, by email, um, asked for feedback on the scope of the framework and given an opportunity to raise any concerns. By the end of the two-week consultation on the 26th of November, responses were received from 12 stakeholders, including from the UK Chemicals Industry Association, Food, Food Federation, uh, Pesticides Action Network, UK um, RSB, ChemTrust and the University of Ulster. Feedback on the rationale and scope of the framework was largely positive, with industry and NGOs welcoming the collaborative working across the four administrations and maintaining a common pro approach for UK and retained EU legislation. Some concerns, particularly around pesticides after the implementation period, and feedback from stakeholders will be considered and incorporated into the professional framework um, as appropriate before it is finalised. Now, phase three, uh, during phase three, an in-depth review uh, and assessment um, gateway process led by the Joint UK Government and Devolved Administrations Frameworks Project, Project Board took place. Uh, this concentrated on the cross-cutting and constitutional implications of the draft framework rather than technical policy elements. And during this time, officials from DERA, Department for Economy, DEFRA, and the other devolved administrations participated in an in-person um, uh, panel review on the 28th of October. Now, at the end of this process, the project board, uh, they made some minor recommendations, but overall they were satisfied that the framework had been developed to an appropriate standard. It is in line with the principles um, agreed by the Joint uh, Ministerial Councils in 2017, and the approach used was consistent with that taken in other frameworks under development. Now, at the beginning of December, the DEFRA Secretary of State will write to the devolved administrations and seeking agreement to additional frameworks. Seven. In the last few weeks, both DARA and the Department. Sorry. Uh, Apologies. Uh, you, just, you just cut me out there a wee bit, Caroline. Oh, apologies. Sorry for that. Right. Are you okay for me to yeah, yeah, yeah. continue? You're okay. Yeah, we can hear you now. Grand. That's great. That's great. Um, almost finished. You'll be glad to know. Are you okay? At the beginning of December, the DEFRA Secretary of State will write to the Devolved Administrations and um, Secretaries, uh, Ministers, seeking agreement um, to the provisional frameworks. And subsequently, at the EFRA Interministerial Group meeting on um, the 8th of December, Ministers will be asked to confirm their agreement. Then, in the last few weeks, both DARA and the Department for Economy Ministers, as signatories to the framework, have given approval for it to move to the next phase in its development. However, as a cross-cutting framework, executive endorsement is needed before this can happen. 
This is currently being considered at today's executive meeting, and have given uh, the, Def the DARE Minister will write to the DEFRA Secretary of State to confirm this prior to next Monday's meeting. This will allow, then allow the Joint Ministerial Council um, for, uh, for EU negotiations to be asked um, for a provisional agreement for the end of the year, at, at the end of the transition period. Now, going forward, um, as the lead Northern Ireland um, Department in the development of this framework, the Durham Minister will again seek executive approval for the final agreed framework early in 2021. The, the committee, ERA committee here, will be offered further briefing on completion of phase four prior to this final agreement. Now, I hope this gives you some insight into what the Chemicals and Pesticides Common Framework uh, is about and the progress made to date. And uh, as you've already mentioned, uh, along with me today, we have Tommy McNamara, um, who leads on the plant protection plant protection product policy for the department and has been involved in the development of the process from the start and also Helen Lewis as head of the new NIEA chemicals policy team and who will have a key role in the operational outworkings of the framework. So if you have any questions, um, myself and my colleagues will be very happy to respond. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much, Caroline, for that uh, comprehensive briefing. I'm going to move around the, mem uh, the members. And William, to indicate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your um, presentation. In relation to the consultation and the stakeholders' responses, you said they were broadly in favour. Were there any issues raised in those responses that were issues about any of the chemicals that were um, on the list? Was there any? I mean, was there any particular issues that a number of stakeholders found or not? Um, what I would say, say yes, they were generally were the, the comments were very positive. Um, um, again, they welcomed the, 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 the joint working, the joint cooperation that was going to be between, between the um, developed administrations and the relative agencies. Um, there was some um, um, note made about in relation to pesticides, uh, and I think Tommy McNamara might be best to discuss that with you. Thanks, Caroline. Yet there were some concerns raised around availability of products and maintaining common standards across the UK. Uh, however, they weren't really in relation to the framework themselves. It was people raising, um, I think it was Pesticide Action Network, were raising concerns to ensure uh, that sustainability and the use of pesticides would be maintained uh, on a UK-wide basis, which it will, because uh, it's not contained in the Northern Ireland Protocol and also about availability of pesticides and there was concerns raised coming from GB to Northern Ireland and vice versa, which will also remain unaffected. So any of the concerns raised, we have had interaction with uh, stakeholders in general and those concerns have been addressed and, and the industry seemed quite content with the, the department's explanation as to how trade will continue. That's good because I was aware there were some issues that, uh, that I was getting on the ground in relation to some products. Um, will the outcome of a, a negotiations, is there a, a possibility that the outcome of negotiations could change any of this? No um, No. <clears throat> But pesticides in particular, um, it will be different slightly for chemicals, and I know it's, it's quite difficult to be over all of these areas at the one time, but pesticides in general will remain unaffected in the short term by Brexit. Uh, uh, from day one, in relation to availability of products, they will still, everything will continue as normal. So uh, a negotiated outcome probably won't make any major difference in the short term. That's good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, William. Uh, Philip? Okay, thank you. Thanks, Caroline, for the presentation. Okay, just following on from William's point, uh, it's maybe for Tommy. Uh, he, he was saying that pesticides are going to be unaffected uh, by Brexit and presumably by the protocol. W what uh, part, or if any, uh, will be affected uh, in terms of this framework by the protocol? And you know, if, if the North is m m perhaps having to stay within EU regulations for chemicals, uh, will uh, England, Wales and Scotland diverge from that? Well, in relation to pesticides, there's a possibility for divergence as we move forward um, because we will be separate 
regulatory regimes, which means that, um, for example, the main, the main ingredient of a pesticide is called an active substance, and active substances are approved at EU level for countries who are subject to EU law, whereas GB will be able to uh, have their own active substances. Uh, so there's a possibility for divergence within that. There's also a possibility for divergence within the setting of maximum residue le uh, levels in, in food and feed because GB will set their own, uh, which could be affected by potential trade agreements when they move into that. Uh, so, you know, just for it's just an example and don't take anything from it. If a trade agreement was agreed with the United States and the United States insisted on higher maximum residue levels of pesticides and food, then that food may well be tradable or allowed into GB, would, wouldn't be allowed to be marketed in Northern Ireland. Okay, so there's potentially some snags down the line then? Potentially some. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Rosemary. Thank you. Um, thank you for your presentation. And as you can imagine, coming from, from Anna, uh, I'm sort of interested in cross-border cooperation. And what you've talked about seems to be mostly east to west at the moment, or west east. What do you th what do you think the problems will be in relation to uh, north south uh, working together in relation to pesticides and chemicals? Because very often farmers buy either side of the border. Uh, Carl and Fionte, I lead off on pesticides anyway. Um, at the minute, the position in Northern Ireland is that all pesticide products must be authorised for use in Northern Ireland. That's the way it is at the minute and that won't change. Um, however, because we are in the protocol, we will still be able to operate what's called parallel trade imports. And I am aware of one, we just got a query this week, funny enough, uh, of one product whereby it is available in the South under a different <coughs> name but has been granted a parallel trade import uh, in the UK um, that allows it to be marketed here. So that will continue, but it will only continue for Northern Ireland. It will not continue for GB. The parallel trade imports that they have will cease. Well, they will continue to the end of their, uh, they're allowed for a number of years and they will be allowed to see out uh, the length of that authorization. But after that, they will not do any parallel trade imports whereas we will. So that will allow trade from south to north and north to south to continue as it normally uh, as it is at present. Okay. Um, and just uh, one, one further question. Uh, what has been the extent of the involvement of DERA in the development of this, of the common framework overall? So I just uh, say that um, the department has been involved for, in the development of the framework right from the very beginning, um, in Jan from January um, 2018. Um, we've been involved in the development of all of the various paperwork and the, the governance structures, and we're also um, involved in the various groups that make up those governance structures. Um, so we have an input uh, into, um, as I say, the paperwork, and we've also with our colleagues in the Department for Economy, which we have we've worked jointly with. Um, we've also also sought input from uh, the executive office to ensure sure that the constitutional elements um, included in the um, paperwork are, are addressed and are correct. Uh, and also, um, it's, uh, we, the paperwork and the, the framework itself has been developed in line with the Joint Ministerial um, Council's um, uh, principles, which take account of the Good Friday Agreement and the, obviously the devolved um, competencies and responsibilities. Thank okay. you. Okay. Um, uh, Morris? Morris, can you hear us? He's mute. Morris, you're on mute. You have to press a button to... Uh, Morris, uh, I might move on to Claire and, to, and then Morris come back to you, okay? Claire, Claire, can you hear me, sir? Claire Bailey? Claire? Can you hear me yes. now? Are you now, Claire? Yes, yes. Sorry, I was chatting about it myself. That was quite crass. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks for the presentation. I just wanted to ask um, 
obviously all these scenarios are dependent on on a deal at the minute um and i'm just wondering are we expecting um any additional legislation and i know that you made mention of it there caroline as well that um additional le legislation will be needed post um i don't know if you said post deal or negotiations or transition period could you let us know what kind of additional legislation we're talking about again it really depends on if there is a deal or not. Um, the current legislation is to deal that initially had been done um, to deal with the no deal exit plans, and th those have obviously been updated now um, to deal with the Northern Ireland Protocol. Um, in terms of additional legislation, it really will depend on what um, what comes out of the current negotiations if a settlement is agreed. Um, I think where um, where we would foresee um, maybe some if there is a deal, there may be some additional um, legislation in the right of mutual recognition. Um, currently, under under the legislation uh, that has been put in and is, is, is currently going through the system, um, we would have a two separate schemes. Um, basically, in Northern Ireland, we would be aligned with the EU, um, say, for example, in REACH, and whereas in the UK, the, you would have a UK REACH or GB REACH scheme, essentially, and whereas uh, chemicals that... Um, uh, um, and and trade in Northern Ireland and the rest of the EU would have to adhere um, to the, um, the EU system. So I think that's, that's where there may be some additional legislation, but at this stage, we just don't know. Okay. And I want to look at um, sort of the dispute resolution mechanisms in there as well. Um, and have you any sense of whether the proposed future Office of Environmental Protection would have any role to play within the Concordat? I think um, in terms of the, um, the, the, the Concordat and the, the Framework Outline Agreement but not as all, all set up for dispute resolution at the minute, it's essentially through the uh, governance structures that have been set up, whereby primarily um, decisions and Disputes would be resolved at the official level within the various working groups. If that can't be resolved there, it's escalated up to um, um, through the um, uh, group, um, which fits in your officials from the devolved administrations and all sit on. If it still can't be resolved, it then goes up through to um, the joint to the sorry the senior. Op Officials Program Board, and and then again, if it still can't be resolved uh, for environmental and for for DERA, say for example, environmental disputes, um, uh, then that would go to the ministers, um, the Joint Ministerial Council. So there is already uh, mechanisms in there. So I don't actually foresee that the provisions um, other than that would have, would would really take effect. I think it's been well thought through as to how we would manage disputes at this stage. Okay, and then am I right? And did I pick up in the, the briefing then that there is within the dispute resolution process that there is a, an agree to disagree solution um, proposed? What would that look like? <laughs> so, if there's all these layers of checks and balances and escalation, um, how would a, an agree to disagree work? I think, well, sorry, first of all, I should say that the, the dispute resolution takes account of the Northern Ireland Protocol. So ultimately, Northern Ireland is aligned with that. Um, so that will take precedent. Um, I think agree to disagree. I think, um, I think again, um, I think if you take the example of REACH, whereby there is uh, the EU is looking at a new authorisation or GB is looking at a, a, an authorisation, which um, is where there is regulatory divergence. Um, obviously, Northern Ireland Ireland would be, would, and the rest of the devolved administrations uh, would be keen not to have divergence. Um, but if there is, um, we would, at the end of the day, we just would, we would have to adhere to what the, the new UK system uh, and the other, the GB devolved administrations, what they decide for a GB um, resolved solution. Okay, thanks. And then is it, is it the, the final parlays with the Secretary of State? Yes. Okay, yeah. thank you. Morris, can, can, can you hear us now? Morris Bradley? He's having trouble with his microphone. I'm having trouble with the microphone, Morris. I can't get you. Uh, I'm going to move on to Harry. Morris, you want to even send us in by message if you want a question raised, if we can't get the, the sound issue resolved. Harry? Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you.
Cali. Just wondering, how will the framework be implemented and enforced? And is there provision to review or change the framework? Thank you. Um, sorry, if uh, my colleagues are content for me to answer this one. Um, I think basically the, the, uh, the framework will be implemented through the various governance structures and, and co close cooperation between the default the, and the secondaries to the framework. Um, sorry, sorry, what was the second part of your question there? Apologies. Um, is there a provision to review or change the framework if uh, that was necessary? <laughs> Thank you. Yes, apologies. Um, yes, there's um, within within the current concordat, um, there is provisions to actually um, conduct a review of the the framework after six months, and then uh, thereafter every after every three years, and it's uh, and, and is a proper review and assessment mechanism which has been built into that. Um, there's also an additional opportunities uh, if there is new legislation or if there's specific issues of concern, which can actually instigate um, a review of the framework and, uh, and maybe necessary any amendments that would need to be made to um, the relevant documents. Okay, good answers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, I'm going to uh, ask a question that was sent in by Morris Bradley. Um, after Brexit, what weight will be given to devolve matters regarding chemicals and pesticides? There needs to be improvement in current restrictions over the use of chemicals and pesticides, and can we legislate for reductions in chemical use? Will there be an opportunity to enhance monitoring of chemicals and fertilizers to ensure reduction of pollutants entering our waterways, which have an impact on wildlife and habitats? In this regard, what scope does Northern Ireland have to introduce further regulations to monitor and reduce chemical impacts on countryside and waterways, or will we be bound by either UK or EU regulations? And that's from Morris Bradley. If you want, Caroline, I'll kick off, although I think there's about 10 questions in one there. Um, <laughs> Get them all in the one go. Why not? Um, I can can uh, make them down again if you want me to. Well, <laughs> I just can't, couldn't write fast enough. Well, if, if I go through it, it's what I can remember. And then if uh, if I miss anything, feel free to come back. Um, okay. uh, in in relation to the fact that EU law applies here, we we we, we are bound by EU law in relation to chemicals and pesticides for authorization of products and use of products, example, for pesticides. However, the sustainable use of pesticides, which is also governed by EU law, is not within the Northern Ireland Protocol, so will continue to operate on a UK-wide basis. That gives Northern Ireland the scope to look at reduction of pesticides, usage, how we can best do that, what are the alternative methods, integrate pest management, um, and to that effect, actually, the, just within this past, uh, the committee will be aware that the consultation has launched on a national action programme across the UK for the reduction of pesticides. Um, <coughs> Northern Ireland, what we will try to do, although we're not bound on a UK-wide basis because it is a devolved matter, we seek to influence the reduction of pesticides across the UK and adopt a consolidated approach across the, the whole of the UK, because one of the uh, objectives of the framework as a whole is to maintain commonality as best we possibly can. Um, there is a lot of ongoing work at the minute on the monitoring of pesticides in our waterways. There are um, policies that have been put in place that are not being replicated, for example, in England, like weed wiper trials, which will aims to reduce the amount of MCPA in the water in Northern Ireland. And those policies we will be able to continue with the um, UK uh, as a whole, the UK government will not seek to, well, they may seek to influence it by saying it's a good idea or something along those lines, but they can't stop us from doing that. And I don't think they would wish to. So we still have that freedom within policies that we can adopt to meet the, the aspirations of the legislation. Yeah, so just again, picking up on Morris, Morris stuff, just for clarification, uh, there, there will be scope for uh, the, the here for the north to introduce further regulation to monitor and reduce chemical impacts on the countryside and the waterways. Is that right? Yeah. Well, well, there's there's always scope. 
Um, but we would have to examine first and foremost as to what we're actually carrying out, because there is quite a lot of the monitor going on, and then decide on the best way forward. There should, there will be scope to introduce legislation, but whether or not that actually transpires, of course, is a different question. Okay. Uh, thank you, Tommy, for that response, and thank you, uh, Morris, uh, for the question. Um, okay, folks, um, as I have no um, members down uh, for any more question. I want to I want to thank uh, um, Tommy and Helen and Caroline for joining us here this morning for your presentation and for taking uh, all of those questions. So thank you very much, and no doubt we'll be seeing you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, folks. The next uh, matter on the agenda here is uh, a written briefing SL1, uh, Official Controls uh, Plant Protection Products Regulation. 2020. Uh, it's page 36 um, on your pack and the uh, department papers on page 39. Uh, this SR enforces and applies the official controls regulation in respect, in respect of plant protection products, pesticides, which regulates um, official controls to ensure compliance with food and feed law, rules on animal health and welfare, plant health and plant regu protection products and has been directly applicable in the UK from the 14th of December last year. Official controls refer to the mechanisms in place and checks carried out to verify that businesses comply with agri-food rules. Previously, official controls in each segment of the supply chain were regulated separately. The objective of the, of the OCR is to create a harmonised and consistent risk-based approach to official controls. It does so by simplifying current control rules and by extending those rules to the entire agri-food chain. Uh, subject to negative procedure and will come into operation in December uh, 2020. Um, uh, members, any uh, comments? Listen to this. We're okay for. Uh, would you move to the next slide, the page? Okay. Okay. The next uh, item is item seven: oral evidence on the seed marketing and fertilizers uh, regulation 2020. The memo from the clerk is at page 80 and the department papers from page 84. The SR will be laid under negative resolution procedure as anticipated they will come into operation at the end of the implementation period. The framework for the marketing of agriculture seed in the UK is provided for through a suite of EU marketing directives, with cereal, beet, vegetable, oil, and fiber plant seed being listed in Annex 2 of the protocol. However, fodder seed was omitted from the protocol, meaning that EU law will cease to apply to fodder seed meaning that different marketing rules will apply to the various species of seed based on where they are listed in Annex 2 to the protocol. The statutory rule amends the 2016 regulation to implement the protocol in respect of seed, uh, of, seed of cereal, beet, vegetables and oil and plant fibre plants. It also provides the marketing of fodder seed to continue under the UK regime. In addition, the amendments provide for fodder seed, which has been certified in the UK to be marketed here under OECD trade rules. The Department advises that a major concern regarding the marketing of seed at the end of the implementation period is the prohibition of the marketing of British cert certified seed for those species listed in Annex 2 protocol due to the fact that Britain will be deemed to be a third country for marketing purposes. Currently, the 2016 regulations only permit marketing of seed for equi from equivalent third countries, which at present does not include Britain. As such, this SR will not introduce additional restrictions. The restriction of marketing... Um, uh, British certified seed is a result of the UK leaving the EU in conjunction with the operation of the protocol. The UK has applied to the EU for third country equivalents for seeds and the UK government requested that the application process be expedited. Um, I'd like to welcome back on to Starleaf again uh, Tommy McNamara, uh, Staff Officer of the Environmental uh, Farming Branch, who was just on us there a few moments ago. So Tommy, would like to give us a bit of an update on this and then obviously members will want to ask some questions. You. Thank you, Chair, and good morning, members, once again. Um, pretty much the, 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 what you've read out is pretty much the position uh, as it stands, uh, Chair. Um, what I can update the, the committee on is the fact that um, we realise that this is problematic for Northern Ireland. The availability of cereal seeds in particular is very much a, an issue for food producers and also seed producers in Northern Ireland. Um, and we have met with industry to advise them on the best way forward. And they have asked us about uh, how we will, how seed will be best brought 
into Northern Ireland, i.e. bringing it in now before the 31st of December. Uh, and we were able to advise them as well that seed that is currently on the market before the third seed that will be on the market before the 31st of December can be continued to be marketed to the end user afterwards. So if seed from Great Britain is on the market as of the 31st of December, that can continue to be marketed and brought into Northern Ireland after the implementation period. Uh, I can also inform you that the minister has written, Minister Pitts wrote to um, Minister Prentice, or Minister Eustace and Minister McConnell Logan Daffin to request them to expedite in as so far as possible the EU equivalence application with EU. Um, I understand from DEFRA colleagues that progress is being made on it, although it's unlikely, highly unlikely, that the equivalence application will be determined by the end of December. There will be an air gap. Um, they are seeing that progress is, is favourable and things are moving forward. Um, the ministers also indicated his concerns to Lord Gardner, the DEFRA minister, under secretary to say, you know, that this is not very good for benefit there for businesses in Northern Ireland and to put pressure as much as possible on to get this application sorted out. Okay. Um, I'm happy to take any specific questions. Chair. Sure. Um, we're, obviously, we're, we're extremely conscious about the impact on businesses. What, 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 what could you just give me elaborate and what practical what, what would be the practical effects of this omission? The omission or the inclusion? Uh, the omission of the, uh, the fodder seed from the protocol. The fodder directive. Yeah. Right. Well, it's less of an issue because the fodder seed directive being omitted means that we can uh, access grass seed from GB. UK as a whole is very reliant on imported grass seed and Northern Ireland is very reliant on grass seed coming from Great Britain into Northern Ireland and where the emission allows that to continue. Um, what we have also done, uh, because we've done this on a UK-wide basis because as I said, the UK has only felt 50% self-sufficient in grass seed. So the decision was taken throughout the UK to allow all grass seed from the, produced in the EU to be imported into uh, the UK. So in this particular SR contains provision to allow grass seed from the EU to come into Northern Ireland under OECD rules. It will ensure that we have, that farmers will not be want for grass seed, there will be an adequate supply. The main issue with this is that it will prohibit grass seed being marketed across the border into the south from the north. Um, that is an issue, and we're aware of it, but that will be due down to the rules, uh, the EU rules that the South will be applying that will prohibit that. It won't be any legislation that we're bringing forward. Um, we also consider it to be the lesser of two evils, so to speak, because um, it would be considerably less grass seed that would go from north to south as it would be that, that would come in from GB to Northern Ireland, there would be a much more major impact if that was to be restricted. So, um, okay, so, so the, 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 the fodder seed has been treated differently to say, for example, vegetable oil and other types of seeds, is that right? Uh, yes, the other seeds that are listed in the protocol, which is cereal, beet, vegetable and oil and fibre, they will not be able to move from GB into Northern Ireland from the 1st of January. We will be able to source them from um, the EU, anywhere in the EU, or from what's called equivalent third countries, but we'll not be able to source them from GB. Um, what's, your what's the department's assessment of the impact that will have on the agri-food sector? Well, the impact it will have is that uh, currently it will probably result in about one... Uh, 1,500 metric tonnes is what we will usually, there will be a deficit of if we don't get um, seed from GB, the cereal seed. However, we will be able to source that seed from elsewhere in the EU and also from the Republic of Ireland. Um, cereal seed producers will be able to access 
seed to produce seed directly from the Republic of Ireland, um, which is produced. There's more of that probably produced in the Republic of Ireland than, than we will ever need. So um, it's difficult to quantify because it's the the manufacturers and the producers, the farmers, etc., do have access to other markets. And the, the seed that they'd be able to access from other markets would they be equivalent to what would have been coming in from Britain? You know, uh, I'm aware of many meeting some weeks ago, I think it was yourself, William, raised it about potatoes, for example, that c come in here. They're a drier variety, and there are a lot of them are be used in a lot of the the uh, chip shops um, throughout the north and the south of Ireland. Right, well, I, I, I don't deal with potatoes, and I understand there's an SL1 next week we'll, we'll cover potatoes, but the quantity of seed, it will all be based, uh, the, the seed has to satisfy certain conditions, it has to be certified to certain standards, and that will continue. For example, the seed that we is required to actually produce more cereal seed has to be what's have to be of a much higher standard than the seed we use to produce food. So... Um, most EU countries only produce that higher standard of seed, and uh, as such, we would be confident that the quality of seed will will be uh, as good as what is produced in GB. So, um, numbers okay? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Oh, sorry, Claire. Sorry, I seen your your virtual hand up on the screen here, Claire. Thanks. Just a hopefully a quick one, but I'm just on what you were asking there in terms for the, the for the UK to be considered as a third country, and if the minister has already written to um, Minister Eustace uh, in Westminster, do, would would we need a deal before the EU agree to that, or before that can happen? No. You know? No, no. Th this is not predicated on a deal. In fact, uh, the equivalence isn't specifically for Northern Ireland. The equivalence is for the whole of the UK. So uh, for for GB. So it's not predicated on a deal at all. Uh, and of course, uh, so there's lots of countries that have the equivalence that you know wouldn't necessarily have trade deals. It's not. It's not a consideration. Okay then, uh, Tommy. Okay, thank you, Tommy. Thank you very much for that. Um, um, so, uh, members, happy enough that we move this on to the next stage? Yeah. Okay. Right, Tommy. Thank you for that uh, briefing and for taking our questions on this one. Thank you very much, Sean. Um, um, okay. Uh, item eight. Then we have uh, written evidence from Dara uh, the producer responsibility obligations uh, packaging waste regulation 2020. The memo from the clerks at page 132 and uh, departmental papers on page 135. This will be led under negative resolution and as this bit will come into operation the 1st of January. The purpose is to amend the producer responsibility obligations to update packaging waste targets for 2021 and 22 and to implement the packaging and packaging and packaging waste directive in this jurisdiction. The, pur the proposed regulations will mirror those in um, uh, in the, the UK and are designed to encourage businesses to take responsibility for packaging wastes produced by commercial activity. The regulations would also encourage producers to reduce packaging through innovative design and by uh, setting challenging targets for the recycling of waste. Um, do members have any any questions that don't, any questions they want to uh, raise with us here? Sure. Yeah, Philip, go ahead. I mean, I understand this is a written briefing. Uh, I mean, uh, Will there be a point then we will get an oral briefing when this comes back? Uh, just, I mean, uh, there probably is an opportunity to ask questions, but I'd rather do it orally than writing. Yeah. Is that the, is that the case? Can we ignore that, Barbara? Or maybe put that request in the department for an oral briefing on? Is that fair enough? It's just, no, I mean, this is an SL. I, I presume that it would come back at some point, no? Yeah. I'd be happy enough to do it then uh, whenever yeah, they well, come back. Yeah, yeah. Um, so... Oh, are we okay at this point then for to move to the next stage? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Before we move into uh, the next uh, agenda item, um, on to the next agenda items, which will be the consideration of EU exit SRs. I want to advise members that um, a query ha had been raised before on the designation of the Secretary of State as the competent body for ensuring that EU regulations are implemented. The department has now advised the following. 
DEFRA is currently the competent authority for organics on behalf of the UK overall. DEFRA Minister is the Secretary of State for Environment, Farming and Rural Affairs. Therefore, noting the SOS as competent authority maintains the status quo and existing, uh, and existing policy will continue as is. So, uh, item nine, the marketing of plant and propagating material um, regulations 2020. Um, the clerk's memo is at page 172, SR is at 175, the memorandum is 180, the SL5 is at 182. Uh, I want to advise members that the SL1 was considered by the committee on the 22nd of October, at which stage members indicated they were content with the merits of the policy. Subject to a draft affirmative resolution procedure, the report from the examiner's strategy rules has been tabled. The examiner has not identified any um, of the issues with the SR. Um, are members, uh, are, are, do my members any objections to this? Are you content enough with this? Okay. Um, so right, we'll, Chair. Sorry? Can I just go back to the previous item? Sorry, it just says in the, in the clerk's brief that this is the committee's opportunity to scrutinise the proposal of the SL1. And it'll not be possible for the committee to suggest any amendments once the SR has been laid. So, would you like? I mean, I, I had a number of questions just in terms of targets for single-use plastics and packaging, uh, just to ensure that I mean, that was part of the the brief. So, I mean, maybe we could write and ask them what targets uh, and what proposals for single-use plastics were contained within it. Okay. Yep. Okay. <coughs> Enough of that, Philip? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Can I just say something on that, sir? Yeah, go for it, Harry. Just, I mean, I thought the targets were pretty good, and the fact that they are going for innovative design, so it all, I was, thought it was okay. Just a wee comment, is that okay? Mm -hmm. Yep. <coughs> okay, then, have enough, Barbara? Oh, yes, thank you. Okay, so just come back. Claire's looking in again. Oh, Claire? Yes, Claire? I'm sorry, I'm not sure if I'm going to mute myself, there's no way for But are, are we putting in the written questions on this then? Sorry, have I picked that up right? Are you telling us, Barbara, that we need to do this now because if this passes, we can't um, come back on it? Yeah, it says in the brief that um, it will not be possible for the committee to suggest amendments once the SR has been laid. So this is your okay. opportunity to scrutinise. Okay, so and um, could I ask a, a question from them then? I, I just I'd be keen to know how the regulations interact with targets, just particularly contained within the circular economy package of policy, um, and how our targets then compare with other EU countries. Okay. Yep. Okay. How it sort of um, fits within the, the upcoming environment strategy? Uh, do they both tie in together? I'll, I'll draft some questions and then share it with the committee to make sure you're happy with it before we submit it to the department. That'll be good. Thank you. Thank you for pointing that out. It was serious. Okay. okay. So we're, uh, um, item, we're, uh, item nine that we referred to a moment ago, the marketing of plant and propagated material regulations 2020. Um, yep. a, uh, as I said, it, well, the rule is subject to draft affirmative uh, resolution procedure. And the ESR um, has no not identified any issues with it. Um, are, are members of, uh, are content with this ESR? Okay. Um, I think we'll put the question then um, that the um, that this the committee for agriculture, environment, and rural affairs has considered ESR the marketing of plant and propagated material legislative functions amendment EU exit regulations Northern Ireland 2020 and recommends that it is affirmed by the assembly. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. So, item number ten then is the Plant Health and Diseases of Animals Amendment EU Regulations 2020. Um, the, the the following documents then is uh, the Clark's memo, page 184, Departments corresponds 186, SR 188, and explanatory memorandum at 192, and the SL5, uh, SL. Five uh, from the department at one ninety four. The committee considered this on the twenty second. The SL one on the twenty second of October was content the merits of the policy, and the rule is subject to the draft affirmative procedure. 
The report from the examiner setting the rules has been tabled. The examiner has not identified any issues with the ESR. Do members, uh, do members um, have any comments or anything they want to say in relation to this particular ESR? Okay. So um, there's no objections raised, so I'm going to just put the question. But the Committee for Agriculture and Environment Rural Affairs has considered SR 2021-52, the Plant Health and Diseases of Animals of Amendment EU Regulations Northern Ireland 2020, and recommends it to the Bay Assembly. Okay. Right. SR item 11, SR 2020-268, the Pesticides and Invasive Alien Species Regulation 2020, the um, Clark's Memo 197, the SR 199, the Explanatory Memorandum, 201, the SL5 Department 203. Okay. Um, the committee considered this, uh, the SL1, on the 12th of November and was content with the merits of the policy. The rule is subject to negative resolution procedure. The examiner's second rule has been, uh, the report has been tabled, and there's no uh, issues that has been uh, identified. Um, do members have any um, particular um, um, any comments they want to make, or are they content with it? Okay. So, um, nobody's raising any objections. Then I'm going to put the question that the Committee for Agriculture, Environment and Affairs have considered SR 2020 the Pesticides and Invasive Alien Species Enforcement per and Permitting Amendment EU Exit Regulation in Northern Ireland 2020, and there's no objection to the bill. Okay. Um, item number uh, 12 on your pack is the uh, Genetically Modified um, Organisms Amendment EU Exit Regulations 2020. This Clark's uh, memo is a 206, the SR 208, the memorandum of 213, and the SL5 as a two, is at page 215. The committee considered the SL1 on the 12th of November, was content with the merits of the policy, is subject to negative resolution, and the examiner statutory rules has uh, not identified any issues with the SR. Um, any particular objections to this SR? Okay, so if there's no objections, I'm going to put the question that the Committee for Agriculture, Environment, Rural Affairs has considered SR 2020 the Nightly Modified uh, Organisms Amendment EU Exit Regulation Northern Ireland 2020, and there's no objection to the rule. Great. Okay. Um, item 13 on your packs. Um, the um, the organic products regulations. So the it's in your packs. Uh, page two eighteen is the memo. Two twenty is the SR. The memorandum two thirty two. The SL five to two thirty five. And the correspondence to the department um, regarding a uh, correction step. Uh, it's in page two thirty seven. And uh, the, the the correction slip is at page two thirty nine. The SL one was considered by the committee on the twelfth of November. At which stage members indicate they were content with the merits of the policy, subject to negative resolution procedure, and the ESR um, report has been tabled, and the examiner hasn't identified any issues with the ESR. Um, has members any questions? Uh, <coughs> Philip? Sorry, I, I ask this question all the time when I see it in there, and I know uh, Barbara will give an answer. I know it was uh, yourself, Chair Barbara, earlier on, just about why uh, the Secretary of State is the competent authority. I presume the answer is the same as the one that was given. Yeah, I can check that out and make sure it's the same same reason. Okay, maybe it may well be, well be the same reason. Um, it's currently the company party for you next like half of the uh, the UK overall. So that, that may well be the answer, but there's no harm to ask the question. Yeah, that's a concern I have all the time when I see it. Okay. Okay. Uh, item fourteen is the um, written briefing. Food and Drink Amendment EU Exit Regulation 2020. Page 241 is the memo. Page 245 is the departmental papers. It's been classified as Category 1 by DERA. When he asked, is asked to indicate it was content uh, for the Minister to give consent for the UK Minister to lay this statutory instrument in uh, Westminster. It was asked to write any comments it wishes to draw to the attention of the Minister. Um, uh, the SA makes amendments to retained e direct EU legislation relating to food information and wine. In relation to food information, DERA has stated that the Food Standards Agency leads on food information and labelling here, and it's confirmed to DERA that it has provided technical amendments on FD11 
11 at an official level to DEFRA and the NA Department of uh, Health Minister's consent is not required. In relation to wine amendments, the SA regulates, uh, relates to exemptions with respect to the import of small quantities of wine sent from one private individual outside the UK to another uh, in, in, to, in Britain in compliance with the conditions set out in the UK reliefs document and wine and grape juice for trade fairs. Dear Evan has stated that this SA will represent no practical or policy change for the year as the EU, EU versions of regulations 1169-2011 and 2018 2017 are directly applicable here under the protocol. Um, our, I remember there's any questions, because there's, there's some other officials on standby if we need any queries around this. Okay with it. Uh, so we can tend to note this SI with agreed form of words we appropriately agreed with the committee. Yep. Okay. Okay, we have a written briefing um, in item uh, 15. Um, the, uh, the, the COVID update. Uh, the latest briefing from the department 252 to 257. It covers uh, CAFRI, Veterinary Services, Animal Health, Environment, Marine and Fisheries Group, Rural Affairs, Forestry and State Transformation, Central Services and Contingency Planning as it has advised that there's nothing new at this stage to report. Um, is there any if I, members of any questions in relating to this um, update, this COVID update from the, the from the department? Uh, today, could you forward them to Stella by the close of play today, uh, or if you want to raise them now, I'm sure Barbara will note them. I, I have well, a couple. I can just read. I mean, just ahead. in terms of the, uh, I mean, I know, I know there was a scheme uh, for the pig industry. So if we could maybe just get a wee bit more info on that, Barbara, when, when will the scheme be finalised, and uh, will it require a, a statutory rule, or, or, or how is it going to be implemented? Uh, I mean, that was just one. And then, in terms of the environmental farming scheme, what was the total number of applications in the previous tranche, and when will the money be issued uh, for the tranche four agreements? And then maybe just if we can get the department to update the committee on the reason for the decrease in the application numbers. Okay, yeah, sure. I'll request that information. Okay. Okay. Um, can, I, can I just I ask... In relation to COVID, the minister did say he had some monies left over that he still had mm. to distribute. Has any decisions been made in relation to that? For example, I know I've had a number of broiler breeders and people like that have been in contact with me. I think pigs has, so, uh, pigs has been one of the, the contract, contract, you know, the factory that closed for a few weeks due to COVID. Had an impact on pig prices, so I think that is raised by, mentioned there by Philip. Uh, yeah, but I'm, I'm talking those, about yeah. the, the 7.2 million that's yes, left over. Yes, 7.2 million. That's I, well, that'll be part of that, the pig. pig yeah, but I'm going to the broilers, yeah, the hens. Broiler breeders are. Would it be helpful to ask for an update on what, where, what the department's current I would think it is. That'll be good, yeah. Mm -hmm. Allocating yeah. that 7.2 million. Mm -hmm. Um, I suppose one of the other things, and I'm sure some, some of it as well, was that the um, the uh, so do a TB TB, TB testing. Um, you know, potentially cattle will have to be tested each time they're moved to March or to another herd. And obviously, this will have an impact on sort of will this influence their sort of the, the draft TB strategy that's going to be coming out. So maybe could we get a wee update on that there? On yeah. The Thinking around the uh, the TB test on the time it's uh, cattle's moved to the mart or to not paired. Maybe also the scheme for potatoes. I think um, there's some issues. I did get a couple of potato farmers that rang me and con concerned about the COVID scheme. There's uh, some issues in around. I think potatoes were inspected and measured up, but they're looking a lot more information. I you know relation to receipts. Where they went and all the rest. Of it. I think it's a bit of an issue for some. Yeah. Um, I suppose, I suppose the, the other thing as well, maybe Barbara, if it's possible to note this, it would be very useful to get a, a like a comprehensive update on the on the exit and the Brexit. You know, we're we're probably where we're at. We're only 20, 
and eight days away from the end of the transition period. So if we get a more detailed update than where we are on the Brexit issue, and we know from some of the evidence we gathered from the port officials and, and other stakeholders that there's um, quite a bit of preparation that needs to be um, done before we're ready for, you know, uh, Rosemary. And Chair, when you've mentioned Brexit, yeah. can I also mention then the issue that raised that was raised last week in relation to the sheep, the importing of the sheep from Scotland and England into Northern Ireland, especially in March time. Uh, There's an issue there when the. Also, we, that, that's a huge so that needs to be. It's about nine thousand sheep. Nine sheep effectively stranded across the border in Britain. Um, Obviously, it's something we've written to George Eustace about in the committee, but it's something we need to keep the, the pressure on because it's, it's a huge, huge impact for farmers here. And all of us, I'm sure, have been lobbied about this. William, you looking in there? Well, that's okay. No, that, so, so, some of this makes no sense. It's very hard to understand, but uh, you know, some of the proposed, some of the problems that we're coming up against, you know, it doesn't, uh, doesn't make much sense. It's, it's the, um, there's lots of scrappy monitored, monitored. It takes about like, seven years, something like that. To, have a flock screaming yeah. on it. So it's uh, Medivis, not too. Uh, so it's uh, it's, it's very, a lot of farmers now have been making contact that they have invested very heavily in, in uh, buying lambs over there. And you know, and there's a, an issue emerging now where you know, obviously they can be outwintered over there, but uh, there's an issue now that they need to be brought back here basically. And it's a huge economic and an animal welfare issue uh, possibly emerging. Okay. So can you keep a focus on it? Okay. But we are expecting a written briefing, yeah. and we're also getting an oral briefing on the 17th of December, yeah. but we'll make sure all these issues are included. Chair? Yeah. And, um, it was mentioned somewhere in that report about the COVID one, about the coal rain meat plant, and mm. that uh, it was closed, and it hadn't affected the overall. Is that up and running again? Really? I'm sure Morris could probably tell us. Um, just it's, it's up and running again, yeah. It's all, it's all good. Well, just to see the wee... Yeah. It's up and running, yeah. That's OK. 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 Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay. Item 16, we've written briefing from the um, NA Rural Development Programme update. Uh, it's page 259 and 275. Briefing advises that the European regulations covering the next Rural Development Programme will not apply uh, to the UK. Under the Solar Agreement negotiated with the EU, projects funded under the Rural Development Programme 2014-2020 will receive the same level of funding as if the UK had remained an, an EU member state. Commitments can continue to be made up to 2023 and receive EU funding until 31st of December 2023 or until EU funds are used up. Whatever is earlier. Withdrawal leg legislation includes the provision to continue <coughs> the current NIRDP uh, schemes until the new policy interventions are finalised. And uh, uh, obviously, you know, then that, that's, that's fine, but the, one of the things, and I know the department have their concern with the Treasury about this is the fact that effectively we're going to be penalised for carrying over um, the funding from the 2014 to 2020 uh, Rural Development Programme into this particular programme has been netted off as the terminology used in the correspondence and the Minister and the Department have written to the Treasury about that and we back that up as well. So, we have, so it's something that we should just highlight as a an issue that we that we're concerned about. We're actually losing £34 million for projects. So, members have enough to note that briefing. Okay. Uh, okay. Correspondence, um, page 266 to 724 of 450 pages of correspondence. Uh, uh, correspondence from Mid-East Antrim Council and the uh, Shared Environmental Services at page 716 to 717. Members will call the committee had written to the council asking it to outline its role and function. The reply gives a brief overview, so it may be worth asking the council to provide more evidence of future data if members are content. Okay. Correspondence from the Department on SA, the Hazardous Substances and Packaging Regulations, page 722 to 724. You will recall that the committee had um, written to the Department to ask what the impact of this reserved SA would be on local business. The department has highlighted that there could be an impact on any business that sells electronic or electronic equipment, electric or electronic equipment, which will mean additional administrative costs 
uh, which will fall to a significant number of largely small and micro businesses here, potentially federating market access. The Minister has raised the issue that therefore regarding the impact and the tactical changes to implement the protocol could have on local businesses in DEFRA has acknowledged that there could be impacts on businesses including aggregate impacts as some of the uh, same businesses that are also uh, affected under the new approach directives. Um, for example, businesses moving uh, electric toys from Britain to North will be required by as, uh, importers uh, under, the, uh, under both the Toys Directive and the ROHS Directive. Different ministers have said that the approach taken is necessary to implement the protocol. Can I agree, can I agree with the members to write to the department to request that it be kept up to date, that we be kept up to date on any further engagement has with DEFRA on this issue and to ask if there has been any engagement with the Department of the Economy? Okay. My well, advice members, the Department has uh, advised that following uh, the request from the Committee after last week's meeting for an urgent update on the Lochney scheme to be available for this week's meeting, the Department is unable to meet this deadline. It advises that the eligibility criteria for the scheme is being finalised and that the Department will be in a better position next week to provide a more detailed response. And this, was this uh, request was made by Patsy last week. Are we okay until action the remainder of the correspondence uh, and, and on the index page is outlined, page 277 to 281? Okay. Okay, number 18, for work programme, uh, page 726 to 731. One of those members that is part of the Assembly Service Standards Committee meeting packs are required to issue to members three days in advance of the meeting. Our first meeting back after the recess, Christmas recess, is Thursday, 14th of January, which means staff would need to be in the building the week before in order to have the pack prepared in advance. In this instance, would members be content if the service standards were waived and the pack issued on Tuesday, which would be two days in advance of the meeting, allowing staff to take their annual leave? Absolutely. Members advise that the substantive items proposed for the um, ERA Committee on the 3rd to the 10th of December are oral evidence from DERA on the common frameworks for animal health and welfare and zootechnical breeding, provisional approval and engagement and on the revised TB strategy. The substantive item proposed on the agenda for the Committee meeting on the 17th of December is oral evidence from the DERA Minister on exit, preparedness and priorities for 2021. A rural session uh, with the Premier Secretary and senior officials is proposed for the 14th of January. Are we okay with that forward work program? No. Members okay? Yep. Um, 19, 19. Members of any other businesses they want to raise? In, we're getting a briefing on the 14th of January okay. from the Department. I think we did ask uh, in relation to independent panels in the issue of. Mm -hmm. I think we did mention that. We're yeah. going to brief on that, and that right? Mm -hmm. that right? That's okay. Yeah, yeah. I think that's important. Yeah. Um, just note to make sure that it's included on, on, make sure, on the Make sure, yeah, the independent panels and the... Yeah. Do you want it on the 14th of January? Do you want to also have that reference maybe for whenever the Minister's officials comes here as well before Christmas? Would that... Do no harm. Do no harm. Okay. Okay, so... The Dittenheim next meeting is on Thursday the 10th of December, this day week at 10am uh, in room 30, and um, we'll adjourn the meeting. Okay. Thank you very much for attending everybody and see you all again next week. This is the